I'm here with Dr. Stephen Lynn and Dr. Lynn is a dentist based in Australia. I'm not even sure what city is it. Is it Sydney or where are you based, Stephen? Just north of Sydney, yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, Dr. Lynn brought out this book. It's called The Dental Diet. And it's out actually a couple of years now. And it's very interesting because there's not too many dentists that are actually writing a book on nutrition. And the other aspect of it, of course, is the information that you have in relation to breathing, oral health and all of that. So we might just start off with this question. Well, first of all, a little bit of your background. How and why did you become interested in nutrition and that area? Yeah, so, I mean, I was always interested in whole body health and how to you know change your performance. I was um, a sports person uh, you know, before I was a, a dentist. Uh, and I studied biomedical science, so I, I do have a bit of a background in, you know, understanding the nitty picky of what, um, you know, scientific processes, um, you know, biophysical processes in the body. Um, when I became a dentist, I, I was a little bit disillusioned with what I felt my skill set was actually achieving for my patients. I felt that it was very, um, you know, treatment based and kind of covering over actually the problem. Um, you know, de dentistry is a very hard skill, you know, Patrick, you've been, you've had close contact with a lot of dentists and you see what kind of people they are, the very, the, you know, um, particular, um, mm. into fine details. Um, I'm, you know, obviously I've got that side of me, but I like to sit back and kind of think a little bit more broadly about things. And I was disturbed that, you know, as a dentist, you kind of, you zoom in, you use loops, you know, to, um, to magnify things and you, you stop seeing the bigger picture. Uh, and that kind of becomes what is happening, you, you know, why are these diseases happening? Why are, are kids' um, teeth decaying at the rates they are? Why aren't their jaws growing? And, you know, you go back into the textbooks and you start to, um, you're not so convinced with the answers. Well, I wasn't so convinced with the answers. I, I didn't feel that some of the disease process I was seeing quite frequently in my clinic was being explained um, with what, you know, we were being taught. And so, it, I actually took some time off dentistry to, to consider whether I wanted to do it for the rest of my life. And um, I was actually traveling through uh, through Turkey and I was in a, um, a traveling hostel in um, in Istanbul. And I came across a book called Physical um, Nutrition and Physical, Physical Degeneration by Weston A. Price. And so that's a book written by a dentist in the 1930s. I, it had never been mentioned to me in my dental curriculum. Uh, but what that talked about was his idea that actually ancestral foods protected um the human cultures from dental disease and all other chronic diseases uh because of what what they gave in terms of nutrition and, and that was a very novel concept to me when i first looked at it i didn't really you know give it much credence i thought oh this has to be disproven you know it's, it's black and white it's i was never mentioned in my in my seven years of tertiary study uh and i put it in my bag and we just kind of went on the way um and it's probably a year or two later i actually picked it back up and you know it's there's you know, 25,000 photographs um, of, of people all around the world. He went to 12 cultures, looked at how the, the modern diet intersects with the ancestral diet. And exactly at that point, you see people's teeth de degenerate. You see decay rates go up to 30%, which are their modern levels. And you see um, the arches shrink. So you see crooked teeth pop up. And that's a really critical point because there's no etiology discussed of crooked teeth in dental disease. And then that began to hit me. I said, there, there is something really important here because if we're not understanding why crooked teeth are happening, we're obviously missing something in the big picture. So that sparked something for me to, to kind of dig deeper. And Price hypothesized that it was these fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A and D, and one other that he called activator X that he never identified um, that were actually driving growth in, in the human craniofacial system. And when cultures, he measured all these foods that these cultures ate, ate enough of these nutrients, the jaws grow naturally in, in the, uh, in the young. And then, but what happens is as soon as you eat a diet deficient, which is the modern diet in fat soluble vitamins, which we've been told not to eat. So low fat diets and low quality, high carbohydrate foods deplete our body of these nutrients. Um, the, the dental organ shrinks with the, the jaws don't grow, the teeth deteriorate quickly because the immune system inside don't work. And so what I found was the story was very compelling. Um, and then so, but as a dentist, I wanted to verify. So I began to look at, you know, modern scientific um, literature, like to see if this would, could be um, verified or, cause I wasn't told this in my education. And 
lo, lo and behold, you know, in, in the late nineties and two thousands, there was all this literature coming out about vitamin D and what it does in the body, not only for bones, but in the immune system. Um, you know, there's receptors in the brain stem cell for vitamin D on, on, throughout our DNA, 25,000 receptors throughout our, our DNA for vitamin D. And through the gut microbiome, it is heavily dependent on this sunlight derived molecule that really does explain why Price found that human cultures all around the world focus on eating these, these uh, foods rich in vitamin D. And then so, and you go through and you, you begin to find that there's actually, um, you know, a big scientific argument to be basing uh, nutritional recommendations ar around dental disease. Like you eat with your mouth. Why wouldn't you, um, you know, why wouldn't you, uh, you know, measure, uh, you know, how foods are affecting the body by, by oral health. And that's something that the modern um, healthcare world has, has really missed that how important dental health is for whole health. Um, and so, pinning that story together from the, the scientific um, verification back to Price's story really was kind of my, my journey into writing the book. I felt that there was a story here that had to be told with a mod, with a modern lens, with a, with the idea of, you know, with modern view of dental disease and how a dental practitioner is seeing it and how we really need to address it through societal nutritional changes. And then from there, it led me into the world of breathing, which was, you know, where we met up, you know, this is the world of myofunctional orthodontics, where we're actually trying to intervene in jaw growth. And that's the physical growth of the jaw, how breathing affects the jaw growth. And then, so I just kept falling into this, <laughs> into this um, absolute rabbit hole of, uh, you know, how the, the, the mouth tells you so much about the body. And it's been fascinating and it's just kept going, to be honest, Patrick, it's, it's, it's been a great journey. I think what's shocking about it is, though, is it, these changes that Dr. Weston Price identified, they actually happened very quickly. It didn't take several generations. Can you talk a little bit about that? I remember one group of individuals he went was the Herber of the Islands off the coast of Scotland. And I think it's on page 55 of the book. He said that the traditional people were eating oatmeal and um, fish and something else. And then commerce started coming to the island and they started eating chocolate and marmalade and sugars, the stuff that, of course, we all eat. Um, and uh, first generation children became outbreeders. It's actually quite shocking. It is quite shocking. And, and it's it, that pattern actually repeats in every culture. As soon as you eat that modern diet, as soon as they replace with the re refined sugars, yeah, the, the canned um, uh, conserves, and the vegetable oils are a big one. So that once you, you bring the refined vegetable oils in, all of a sudden, in one generation, the 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 teeth deteriorate. And it's both of those things. It's the decay up to modern rates, 30%, and it's the the arch collapsing. And then and then you get the dysfunction. And so we, we've got the problem now where, where dentists are starting to switch on to the fact to, that we can actually intervene in this, this growth Um problem you know so by into understanding the breathing system the tongue posture the closed lips all of this but that happens when our skeletal system is deformed from eating the wrong nutrients and i think an example that were that gives you know probably quite a um a poignant way to look at it is if you look at nutritional rickets you know that's where the um the femur bone of young children um is is deformed because of a lack of vitamin d and it's it for some reason, we've not seen that the craniofacial stru structure or the bones in, in the um, in the mouth are, are listening to the environment and actually, you know, growing uh, in response to what we eat, both by physical chewing and nutrients. And the nutrient question is the one that I think that that really needs to drop. That's one that we haven't got there. And I was hoping, um, you know, that we would that my book would bring wider discussion on this, but the idea that vitamin D deficiency and nutrient deficiency can drive the, um, the, the improper oral posture that drives mouth breathing and the breathing epidemic that we're seeing sleep apnea, which is, you know, over a billion people on the planet. If you go and analyze all these people, with their craniofacial development, you'll see the same pattern and you'll, you'll see that modern diet that price found. That's the real kind of the, the, the breakthrough where we start to kind of change this in our next generations. And, you know, I've, I've got three children now and I'm trying to, um, you know, enact this into, into their life. So they don't ever have this problem and it's not easy, you know, and, there's another set of um, research called the Pottinger's cat study that brings up a really good um, idea of how you see it through generations. And once you change the cat's food over three generations, they, they, the first generation get the crooked teeth. The second start to become, you know, much more sickly and much more 
their bones become much more brittle. By the third generation, their bone density has gone down. I think it was down to 1% or something quite alarming. Fourth generation, they're completely sterile and they, they don't survive. Now, if you think of where we are at with the Pottinger's cat study, we're at the precipice of that fourth generation. And, you know, in the dental surgery, we're seeing this and, you know, your work has really highlighted this, you know, in, in children, you know, kids don't know how to breathe today. Why is that? And, you know, we can retrain people to breathe. How do we do this? How do we re um, revive this uh, kind of inner um, natural growth and development of the craniofacial system where it doesn't happen at all? I think it has to be based in the foods we understand that grow the jaw and grow the system so that the the um, the airways aren't inflamed, so the bones are strong and so that they hold the airways open and hold the volume of the um, of the nasopharyngeal area so that, so that we don't breathe through the mouth at night and that we don't choke on our tongues um, during sleep. And there, there's a little way to go because, you know, we, epigenetics show us that, um, it, well, Pottinger's cats show that it took three generations to fix those third generation cats. So you, you, you eat the generate the, the food for, um, for three generations, you have to fix it for three generations before they restore the same level of health. So that shows we've got a bit of way to go. It's three generations before our children will be back to that level of health. It's a lot of work to do. In terms of the development of the face and back in the 1870s, CV Tomes or T-O-L-M-E-S, and I'm not quite sure if he was a medical doctor or if he came from a dental background, he coined the frame adenoid faces. And if you do a Google search of adenoid faces, you see these faces which are quite unattractive. The jaws are set back. They're really tired looking, long, narrow faces. And ultimately, that's what you're talking about. They may not be quite as extreme as that, but a healthy face is a good looking face. And a healthy face, when you're talking about the arches, you're talking about the maxilla. Will you just talk a little bit about the importance of that when it comes to sleep and the impact that if the jaws are set back, what does it do to the airway and the knock on effect on that one? Yeah, that's really interesting because, you know, if, if we start to think, you know, back to Western A. Price's perspective, you know, what what's the, the, the ground zero of this? And, you know, the, the, the kind of scary reality is that when you look at newborn jaws now, the, some of them are just born with these really, really small, high, narrow palates, and that's the maxilla bone. So the, the roof of the mouth is the floor of the nose, and that's the maxilla bone, this, this whole um, structure that creates the, the, the cheekbones, nasal sinuses. It all sits in one system. The teeth sit up into the bone. And so when we have a small, narrow arch, a high arched palate, uh, we have crooked teeth because the teeth don't fit because the dental arch is too narrow. But we also, um, we, we have a, a nasal system that is cramped and small as well. Um, and that's not something that was taught um, to dental students in that the uh, the upper uh, dental arch is is connected by literally by the same bone to the nasal sinuses. It's taught to you, you know, in straight anatomical terms, but in terms of function. So, right. So, how is breathing affecting, you know, um, or how is the the dental arch showing us how a patient is breathing? So when you see these, and this is unfortunately, it's such a, it's a majority now of um, children and even adults now that, um, you know, that even have been treated with orthodontics often have underdeveloped uh, maxilla bones. And the, the symptoms you often get are the, the people that you, that you really have, um, you know, probably done most of your work with it, the people that feel like they can't breathe through the nose mm. or they, or they breathe through the mouth and they don't know that they, they do that. They don't know how to breathe because they're, 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 the resistance through their nose is so um, is distressing for their airway. It feels like they're suffocating and this idea. And then, you know, you think about asthma and you think about, um, you know, respiratory issues, you think about swollen um, immune tissue, like adenoids and tonsils, like ad, uh, um, the adenoid face that, that yeah. uh, is the classic long face. You know, this whole thing is talking about someone that can't breathe through an underdeveloped maxilla. Um, and so that volume, when it's smaller, it challenges the brain because there's pressure sensors right through the airway and those pressure sensors fire when it, when, when it senses there's too much, um, too much pressure going through the airway, like that's a choking response. So when you sleep, you then get this, um, you get these, uh, sympathetic drive, uh, fight or flight messages to the brain. And then you get, um, you know, either the, the response to, to pull the jaw 
forward um, or you get the deterioration into snoring. So the maxilla bone really is like the breathing organ, um, mm. you know, that when you think about it, because it supports that crucial um, exposure to nitric oxide through the nasal sinuses. And if you have a narrow, small palate and crook upper teeth, you will have by definition, a, a smaller nasal sinus, which gives you less access or, you know, you see people with underdeveloped palates and they still breathe. Okay. So some people do, and this is where Bateco is, is, is excellent for, um, for learning how to breathe with what you have. But if we understand that, Hey, structurally, this is a challenge. It helps us to kind of guide us to, you know, maybe better, um, you know, long-term solutions that, you know, because during sleep, sometimes the resistance becomes a problem that's snoring for even a good breather. But this organ there is 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 really critical, and, and we can change it. We can even change it in adults. We can certainly change it in kids. Um, you know, that's what we're doing now in our clinic. We we literally just opening up this palate in in nearly every child that um, that comes in because it helps them breathe. So all the symptoms there, they're experiencing the um, ADHD like symptoms, the um, asthma, their adenoids and tonsils. It is all from this organ being underdeveloped. Yeah, it's. It's amazing. You're not just expanding the width of the palate. And I suppose the other thing is you're also helping to to guide forward growth to open up the pipe. And I think anybody that listens is going to understand that we need to have a decent pipe that's carrying that air to and from the lungs. And if we are compromised in any way that there's nasal resistance, which is impeding airflow, it's going to then cause for example us to arouse from deep sleep where the brain is cleaning itself and all of that's good stuff in terms of the dental profession how come they have overlooked this like i'll give you an example i went down to my cullen which is my local village here and there's a dentist there who graduated from my alma mater trinity college in dublin and he's only young he's, he's only about 35 years of age he didn't know, he doesn't know me, he doesn't know what I do. And I started talking about the impact does mouth breathing affect craniofacial growth and things like that. And he said, no, none, none. He, he didn't know anything about it. So he didn't have much of a contribution to say. And I was just thinking, but this guy's just recently graduated from probably one of our best universities. And there's been no talk about it. And the other thing, Stephen, you pointed out that overcrowding of teeth now is quite common it's not just overcrowding of teeth is it it's pointing out that the the maxilla is too small there's not enough room for the tongue the tongue is going to encroach the airway and it's going to impact the risk of sleep apnea so the dental profession i can't get my head around it um although there are some wonderful dentists but the dentists who have been talking about this they haven't always had support from their colleagues so why has the dental profession as a whole overlooked it What's what's the benefits of it? Or like, what's their motive? I remember when I was first coming across these concepts because the price book brought me on to the idea of nutrition as as being you know the the root cause. So I was looking at it from that lens when I kind of came across the world of my functional orthodontics, which is the idea that you grow the jaw to fit the teeth instead of fitting the teeth into a small jaw. Now the the problem is that I mean, well, firstly, if we think about the way the dental uh, professional is trained is that it's all about diagnosis of existing um, existing conditions. And so in orthodontia, it's about classing the malocclusion. That is all you learn about, about the um, alignment of teeth is that there is a genetic problem that is either class one, class two, class three, and you can measure it like this. And here's how you correct it. And so the, that was you can kind of can go I, back into the can i stop you there though yeah why do they say it's a genetic problem if our ancestors had straight teeth in the main so i mean that's been based on on poor evidence to be honest like it really has not there it's just a it really is a lack of one going into anthropological understanding of the of the human craniofacial system because it's so obvious once you look at it there's just no dental malocclusion once you go back you know to um you know to, to the agricultural revolution and it's very few industrial revolution where it steps up and it really steps up again you know in the, in the last few decades um you know so it the anthropologists for instance have been have been reporting this corachin has been reporting this um, published hundreds of papers on how dental malocclusion changes, you know, both in primates, in, in, um, in uh, human populations, both rural, not, it, depending on where they live. You've, uh, you know, once you move into a city, you, you start to get more crooked teeth. 
it is all there. It's, I would say that it's quite a hard concept to get your head around as a clinical dentist is trying to teach it, right? Um, I remember when I was first trying to understand the way breathing, for instance, affects um, affects the maxillary growth. That didn't drop for me as, as in my dentist's mind mm. for quite a long time. So I think for the dental profession, it's a difficult um, it's a difficult concept in our lens to see because we are looking at the teeth like that, and we, we, it is it is hard to kind of equate, you know, with causality that this, the, what we're looking at is actually, um, is actually caused by that. So I don't I think, think that... it is. <laughs> I, and, you yeah, know, yeah. I like, I, I'm a lay person here looking into a profession, <laughs> right? You have a problem. Let's step back a bit and see what's actually going on. And even if you were to talk of say, so you're saying that the last few decades, now, by the way, you're, I'm not uh, criticizing you at all because you you get this, but I'm just trying to get my head around it. If I went into a, a primary school today, which are typically children of about 10, 11, maybe 12 years of age at the upper, probably 75% of those kids are going to require orthodontic treatment. If we went back to the 1950s, which is not a whole lot of long ago, it's two generations, we would see that most of those kids probably don't need orthodontic treatment. In actual fact, crooked teeth then cannot be classified as gener as genetic if the change has happened primarily in two to three generations. Am I getting this incorrect? So then why isn't a profession actually looking at the broader picture and asking what on earth is happening here? I mean, I think if, if, we, if, if we're blunt about it, um, it, it's probably more like 90%. You know, if you really kind of get into proper diagnosis of, um, you know, of, of malocclusion and, um, and, you know, beyond just like straight dental arch alignment, you're going to find, um, underdeveloped maxilla and, and mandibles in 90% of the population now. And I remember when I went to school, it was probably two, three kids, you know, in the nineties that, um, that had braces and now it's, it's up to 90%. That's alarming. And like, that is really, really, um, quite concerning. Um, and so the, the problem is that correcting these things makes a lot of money. And so it's a question that doesn't bring a lot of, um, it doesn't bring a lot of reward because you have to nest. So just go kind of giving a, another view is that one other approach to this is my functional orthodontics to prevent the malocclusion. And so uh, as a practitioner that does this, I can say it's very, very difficult to work against the system that has been doing it the other way for a long time. So I would say that if, you know, it's, if you've got the, if you're in the middle of a hill, you've got the option of walking all the way up this very steep hill or, or, or rolling down. You're usually going to take the option of going down to, to potentially reach what you would call the same um, destination. I think that's, that's the reason is that healthcare is based around item numbers. You know, in the UK, you have the NHS. So very hard to enact these kind of principles in a system that is, is run um, by the government and item numbers and so forth. That is probably the, the, the reason why it hasn't been because you have to build whole new diagnostic systems, my functional orthodontics also you, you work with a little bit of faith. Like you have to, you have to, you have to within you, you know, believe that, that this child should be bigger and that this is going to work and that the teeth will fit and let the body put the teeth. Uh, orthodontists, you know, don't like that. They like to put the teeth where they want to put the teeth. Dentists like to put things where they want exactly how they want to. Letting the body do things is a bit different and it's very kind of un, unnerving as a, as a practitioner letting go of all that is, is difficult. I, I'd say that's probably an explanation as to why it hasn't come about because you look at earlier 1900 orthodontic textbooks, they talk about facial development. They talk about these kind of, um, you know, these kind of ideas that it was a lack of development, but it was all thrown out in, in the, in the later 1900, um, 1900s. Yeah. And so it was an idea that we, we lost. And so if I was to make an, <clears throat> You're saying there's two traditions or there's two schools of thought in the broader sense. So you have your your conventional orthodontist, if I was to go down to, in Galway, and uh, my child who has got high narrow palate, she's teetogenesis, she is overcrowding of teeth. They will say, well, there's overcrowding of teeth, so let's extract two teeth to make room for the existing teeth, and then we'll straighten up those teeth. But the problem is she already has a small mouth, which is causing the overcrowding of teeth. Teeth are extracted, and now the mouth is smaller again. The face is retracted. 
And now it's almost setting her up for sleep apnea for the rest of her life. I looked for a, a functional orthodontist here in Ireland. And I there's about two of them in the entire country. So I traveled down to court to Dr. Tony O'Connor. So he has been gently expanding her maxilla and also directing forward growth to make room for the teeth. And because of the missing incisor, to make room there that we will put an amp implant. So hopefully we've got sufficient room in the mouth. It's not perfect and it's not an easy journey for parents. It's there's a bit of time involved. Children are not the most compliant. So I can see mm. that there's, you know, there's no easy solution. But as a parent, I would want to know what are the two options. You know, why just go down this approach here? It just, for me, it seems so easy. You know, let's pull a few teeth, throw on the brackets and off you go and you pay your three, four, five thousand euro or spend some time with this approach here, which you get the benefits for the rest of your life. And the other thing is, I suppose, in the main is it's not just about straightening the teeth. It's really about developing of the face. So would you say that a good looking face will naturally have straighter teeth? Yeah, so in general, you know, you can kind of do the, the um, there's mathematical, you know, Fibonacci calculations of the proportions and everything. And you find these proportions and angles uh, in well-developed maxilla and, and jawbone. So these angles, um, you know, ar around the mouth. Um, and so and you in these palates that have these large, you know, you know big um, intermolar widths, these huge 50 um, mil intermolar widths. And, and you just don't see that in kids anymore. Um, so there is certainly, you know, if you look at kind of, you know, the Hollywood, Hollywood face, you see these, these lovely angles of, of cheeks and, and, um, and, and jaws as well. So, and, you know, we know that the human brain is wired to see these as, um, you know, looking at a mate for attractiveness, but also health. And you can explain that physiologically because just, just straight by airway volume. If someone has better airway volume, they're going to have, you know, a, a much lower risk of all these chronic diseases that that our children and, and and now we are experiencing because of these collapsed airways and the lack of ability to use these airways. Um, you're exactly right in terms of the the differences between myofunctional orthodontics or in, or pre orthodontics and uh, and conventional orthodontics and braces is that one is very difficult and and this is a conversation I have with parents daily. I never try to sell that this is easy. I sell I try to tell them that uh, you know this is a journey that we're going to try to take to catch up the growth and see what the teeth do. And the child has to be compliant and enthusiastic and do lots of exercise for two years at a time. It's a very exhausting process that they get sick of, that the parents get sick of, the practitioner gets sick of trying to convince them to do it. So it's a difficult system. You can imagine that, you know, if we could just put wires on this thing and put all, put all the teeth in there and it's much more predictable and you can, you can guarantee to the patient that this is going to work, why there is, you know, that is more attractive. Um, in, in one sense, but the physiological aspect is inarguable. You can't argue that, that there is benefits to this, you know, especially when there's existing symptoms. Um, and, but, but now what we know about the sleep apnea um, ep yeah. epidemic that's happening, there's over a billion people on the planet with this, you know, this really should be coming into public policy that we need to develop these, these, yeah. these bones to prevent this. Cause this is going to cost us a lot of money in the future. When, when people are on CPAP machines, having heart attacks because of the connection between sleep apnea and um and cardiovascular events but then the big one and the one that comes after is the alzheimer's and dementia epidemic which comes up which is directly in the, the literature linked to sleep apnea so there is such a, an economic argument to invest in in these kind of um expansive therapies to grow the jaw teach a, a young child to breathe so that they don't have that risk of cardiovascular and then dementia down the track which will cost the healthcare system so much more in the long term yeah, and even it does existing conditions such as depression is very closely linked with sleep apnea. Um, I'm just going to show you a photograph here because I think it's always nice to have a picture and everybody will know pretty much this picture here. I don't want to say anything negative, of course, about the royal family or anything like that, but we're looking at... This is always a picture that intrigues me. If, for example, we were to look at Prince William here, we can see that his jaws are quite narrow and there's black triangles either side. And normally what I do is I count how many teeth can I see when I see somebody smile. 
And with him, it's it's not that many. You know, he is a mouth like mine. It's quite small until I went to William Hang. <laughs> if we look at Kate Middleton, she's got really a broad facial structure and a wide arch. So her arch is much wider than his. She will have plenty of room for her tongue on the roof of the mouth. She's not likely to have sleep apnea because she's not going to have that high narrow palate. Mm. Possibly when the, the arches are so narrow here that the, the palate is going to be quite high. It's infringing on the nasal airway. The jaws are set back. So even royalty can, uh, can suffer from various craniofacial abnormalities. But tell us a little bit about Harvold's studies back in the 1970s. And I know parents sometimes are a bit aghast about what he did with young monkeys but it kind of it's predicting what's happening now with the human population. Absolutely, and so yeah, some of these earlier studies, you know, showed us, you know, how you know malleable the the the, the upper and lower jaw are, and you know, through a number of different species and so forth and interventions. But th there's no argument that the that that the, the jaw is malleable to its environment. You know, we see that both through through nutrition, but then also through um, you know, orthodontic intervention and expansion that, that you can change the jaw. So there is, it, it's, it's funny that after the 1970s and some of these, a lot of these studies were done, those kind of perspectives dropped away. You know, we, we began to lose that perspective and just really focus on the mechanics of moving teeth, like finding really fine little devices that could, that could pull a tooth a certain way or pull a, a canine out of a, a, a maxilla that didn't develop enough because the canine sit up in the literally under the nose because the, the, the front of the maxilla, the pre-maxilla didn't grow forward. And you know, this happens very frequently now. It's major surgery to get this to, to open up a canine and then pull it down. Um, or if you're going to see William Hang, he's reversing, um, you know, extraction orthodontics by opening up implant spots and pulling, um, pulling jaws forward. Did, did you, are you having that done? Um, no, I had it done about Patrick. 10 years ago. Dr. Hang has since retired. I think he has anyway. I think there's somebody else now in his practice. But, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I used yeah, to fly over him back to California, but no, that's going back quite a while. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's it's major. But so it's, it's all about the philosophy. For some reason, in the 1970s, the, or roughly around the 80s, the philosophy just fell off, you know, and we just became obsessed with. Um, the, the finer mechanics of orthodontics and and we forgot about the, the how the, the jaws are uh, you know listening to the environment and, and then subsequently all of the issues with the adenoids and tonsils which you know 80s and 90s were I'm not sure if it was the same in the UK but they, they were just cutting them out left right and center in the 80s and 90s right yeah and uh, and the thing the funny thing about that is there's been a reverse in that trend because they were so um, surgically focused and they've actually gone the other way to stop and now as practitioners I'm trying to get um, surgeons to remove these these sw swollen lymph tissues and immune tissue and and they're a little bit hesitant and so it's it just kind of flows in in a really nice neat story that we need to understand how this how this jaw system grows or we're going to have these problems keep coming up the removal of the tonsils and adenoids too are a little bit controversial i had my own daughters removed and i don't know if i would embark on that approach again and the only reason being was I came across a study that was conducted in Denmark and they looked at a million children over 30 years and the children who had their adenoids and tonsils removed had three times the risk of upper respiratory and lower respiratory. In other words, I'm not sure if it was three times the risk, but it was a significant risk of diseases later in life. And also when I went in terms of my daughter was having her adenoids and tonsils removed, there was no instruction by the ENT to do nasal breathing post-surgery. So when you're working with children and you're seeing that, yes, we need to really develop their maxilla, these kids can have sleep apnea. And in a child, how would a parent know if a child is, or not know, they're not going to know, but how might they get an indication that a child is having sleep apnea? So the with the adenoids and tonsils of that study, it brings up a good point. And I, I, I really think the takeaway from that is, is you, you brought it up exactly is that we're not retraining the child how to breathe after the surgery. We're just cutting the tissues out and then letting them on the way and seeing how they come back there that, you know, how, how we can influence our, our breathing, how, how many um, factors we can, we can introduce and in training and so forth that, that we can change the breath with none of that, that is considered. 
And then on top of that, we're not developing the, un because if they have a, a, an existing breathing issue with, with adenoids and tonsils, they have a craniofacial problem as well uh, by definition. So we need to take a multifactorial approach here. I believe that the adenoids and tonsils help. And the reason is, is that in roughly the three to six year old age, it's very hard. We do expansion on three year olds, but you can't do it on every child and it takes about six months. But in a child that's snoring, uh, it's very, very difficult to get any other interventions um, to stop the snoring the, if they have swollen adenoids and tonsil tissue. So I think there's a role there. And I think that if it's performed with both craniofacial growth, so you get a four-year-old that has their adenoids and tonsils out. So what we do is we make the full diagnosis. We we identify the breathing issue. The, the, the symptoms that come up are usually, you know, the child doesn't sleep well. So some children just don't sleep. And then you dig in is they just don't breathe well. They, they're, they are anxious going to sleep because they're nearly choking um, going to sleep. They're grinding their teeth. Like so many, um, you know, pediatric dentitians are gr ground nearly down to the, the gum line because the, the child's airway is in distress. Um, the, they wet the bed at night. They, um, you know, they, they frequently wake or, they, or they're just, or they're just tired in the morning, like dead tired. Or the, the really obvious one is kind of loud, loud snoring, loud breathing, gasping, all of these things just come into this, um, this, this whole presentation of poor craniofacial support during sleep. Um, so when parents, when we see that and say a three or four year old and they've got the um, swollen adenoids and tonsils on the CBCT scan, then, you know, the, the, the intervention there to expand the palate, for instance, or to do myotherapy, doing myotherapy on the tongue it, on a four year old really doesn't yield a result that's going to change their sleep because you can't really teach them really effectively to do that um, at that age. Uh, so that it's going to change their sleep. Taking the adenoids and tonsils out gets us an instant result. But if you just leave, if they just go on their way, it, they will come back and they'll have the same problem again in, in two or three years. But if they're back in six to 12 months and we're doing expansive therapy on them now, because it's very yes. difficult also to, to grow a maxilla in a child with swollen adenoids and tonsils. So you're trying to create a breathing um, organ and you're trying to expand it. They can't breathe. Very difficult. It doesn't work as well. Yeah. Um, so, so when you, you do the surgery, then you do the expansion, then you do the breathing retraining and the myotherapy, then you're starting to, the whole thing starts to catch up and then you're starting to get them into their growth um, trajectory. And we, we treat mainly, I find that the sweet spot is roughly seven to nine because seven to nine, they're at that starting curve of that, the, all the, the adult teeth starting to fall out. And then we've got the big growth phase between seven to nine. You put an expander in there, it just blows up and then you've got enough space and you can just do the tweak slowly up until they're 11, 12, and then the teeth fit nicely. Um, you know, we were gathering a really nice, um, cohort of, of cases now where we've, we've, th there's just lovely developed arches um in our patients now because we take this approach from a younger age and it does it, it's a lot of effort you know to put this whole system together it took us a long time you know um you know we we use part there's lots of different systems you know myobrace is one orthotrop um uh john muse orthotropic systems really good too um you know mike hang does a lot of things alf there's a lot of different dental appliances that do it and you kind of have to use different systems for different cases uh, it's it's a difficult one to put in but when it really is just driven by this idea that the, that the craniofacial system is a breathing organ and we're trying to develop that as much as possible. Aside from, say, the craniofacial development, oral health is impacted by whether a child or an adult is mouth breathing or not. And if we go to a dental surgery, we'll probably see a poster up on the wall sponsored by Colgate about the importance of brushing your teeth. How far does brushing teeth go in comparison to a child who is constantly mouth breathing or an adult? What do you see when you look into the child's or the, 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 the mouths of people who are mouth breathing? Yeah, the, the breathing is a, a big one and, and you really see it in the, in the younger, younger children. So in the younger age groups, you know, probably, um, you know, six months to two, you, you see that the bad breathing really, really affects their um their risk of decay um and so that's when you you, you have that dried out um you know whitish enamel ar around the, the 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 front surface of the teeth and you know the the breathing factor really isn't one that we've considered very well in in dental decay and, and you know when you look at the um immunological you know pr protective factors in saliva we know by definition that if they're breathing through the mouth they're going to be reducing that that protective factor and then you put the extra challenges like you know things like 
poor so poor breathers are poor sleepers and so this is a really unfortunate thing of seeing a lot of as exhausted parents that are feeding their kids breastfeeding through the night and then they're coming in and and their um their child has got a, a mouthful of cavities and they're a mouth breather and it's just it, it's a really sad um it, it's a really sad presentation because you know they feel hopes they've been doing their best but then you, you've got this poor child that has to go into hospital to have these teeth pulled out and you know it really comes down to um it's a hard thing, you know, because you've got to guide the child early and you also have to make sure that the, the child has this sufficient immunological factors, which goes back to the vitamin, sufficient vitamin D. So um, in Ireland, especially where you're at really high risk of vitamin D deficiency, the population at high risk of vitamin D deficiency, we know that, for instance, that um, in vitamin D deficiency during pregnancy will, will increase early childhood caries as well. So that's been shown in studies. So when when you have these vitamin D deficient kids that are mouth breathing, that are, um, you know, toothbrushing really comes last in that sense, you know, plaque, plaque control really does, you know, it, it does have, play a role, but if kid is vitamin D deficient and they're, and they're breathing incorrectly, they're not, and the other factor is sleeping. When they don't sleep well, they don't get the melatonin um, repriming the endocrine system to mineralize the, the skeletal system. You've just got a, a recipe for, for decay and breathing really sits right in the middle of it. Um, you know, in the presentation, it's really easy to identify too. If you see that, you know, in, in our clinic, we, you know, we're looking at the vitamin D deficiency. We're looking at their sleep. We're looking at, you know, their cranial facial growth so that we can try to get this working in the correct way. And, and it's not easy. It takes time. You know, a, a palate takes six months to grow at least. And then you have to teach a child how to put the tongue up to the roof of the mouth and they're sick of it by then you have to keep going and trying to, to persist so that they do it at night and it's just innate. Um, it's, it's a hard thing to reprogram. But it's giving these kids and adults skills for the rest of their life. You know, you'll be aware that 90% of people with sleep apnea are undiagnosed. And I was one of those kids and teenagers that was mouth breathing, crooked teeth, everything else, you know, and it, it's it's really difficult for a child to go through the academic system with poor sleep. And coming back to the sleep apnea, any child we shouldn't hear their breathing during sleep. Is that correct? We just go as far as saying that because sometimes you hear a man, a man is snoring and it's okay. Okay. It's normal, but it's not normal. But for a child, how should they breed or what other factors might a parent identify? So the child as noisy or breathing, they stop breathing, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. There's the really obvious symptoms like, like the, the snoring or, or the open mouth breathing gasping is one. Sometimes you can get like little ticks, like, like quick breaths in, or, or they'll say there's, there's funny kind of, um, in between breaths or noises, restless legs. So, so kids that jump around the bed that throw the, the blanket around, throw the pillow around is a big sign to, um, the frequently going to the, either bedwetting or going to the toilet all night is a big one too, because they don't, they don't switch off that that response um tired in the morning and grumpy kids the the dark circles the the lack of venous pulling lack of venous pulling is because the, the child breathing it's a mouth breathing it's a sign of a mouth breather because the lymphatics haven't drained from under the eye here and, and you get the dark pulling there that should happen during the nice quiet nasal breathing during sleep um the you know the really concerning thing about sleep apnea is i think it's really poorly diagnosed in children i don't think we really know what actual sleep apnea in, in the pediatric populations because we're trying to, to diagnose it off an, an adult um which is is questionable as well in terms of polysomnographs and ahi so you're trying to get an ahi on a kid you're waiting for a kid to have pauses like can a kid have pauses you know like or are there kids experiencing things differently and i really think that sleep tests are, are incredibly um you know inaccurate and, and not very helpful for children because the signs and symptoms are there. If we can see the, um, you know, these behavioral and, and, and other uh, craniofacial risks, then the, the, um, the argument to intervene is already there because we know the dangers to the development of the brain of the child. And, you know, you said yourself, you know, trying to concentrate in school uh, when you are sleep deprived is, you know, a good form of torture, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, that, that will send you crazy. Um, so, you know, parents that want the best for their children, they really need them to sleep well. And, you know, if they're not breathing well, they, they don't have a chance of that. But the problem is, Stephen, that parents are not aware of it because the professions aren't driving it, neither the medical nor the dental profession. And I don't think anything is going to really happen until that drive. I think the drive is going to happen from the ground up. Um, of course, there's wonderful dentists and doctors up here. And 
but they are the minority. It's really about getting this information into the hands of the parents and for the parents to understand it. In terms of coming back to the dental diet, because I know we're coming to an end, is there anything that you would encourage your patients to help to improve the microbiome? My, microbiome? Yes. Oh, just on that point, Patrick, it's funny, you know, like I think we we met in person in 2018 um, and I just released my book and, um, you know, I was kind of really trying to push this this kind of uh identification of, of, of crooked teeth as a, as a, you know, overall health thing. And, um, you know, I, I, I kind of went through the U S you know, and it was a very hard message to get across. Um, but what I'm seeing now, you know, five years later is we're in the clinic now and it's actually the, the parents are starting to come to us. They're driving from us from two hours away because they know they're looking at these, the, their child breathing and all they're looking at them sleeping and saying, this isn't right. And so it's becoming more and more frequent. It's like there's a switch or an awakening happening that parents are starting to identify this in kids. And it's a really simple thing to teach a parent to do, to, to um, identify disordered breathing in, in day or, 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 or night um, times that, that it really um, it is so easy for them to see as long as they know the importance and the ones that know it's important, they're driving straight to, they're on the, they're in the car for three hours driving their child. They're like, you did the same thing because you know, it's important, mm. but it's, it's definitely been slow and, it, and it's, there's a lack of clinicians out there, but it's happening. Um, and I think the clinical systems have been in, in the process of being developed to how do you do this efficiently? Because it is a difficult thing to do, but we're getting closer there to be able to, um, I think hopefully start to plug this into, you know, wider audiences where, where hopefully more kids will get access to it. Um, in terms of, in terms of the microbiome of food, I really think too, that the, the early feeding habits are, are, are one of the, you know, the ground zeros of this. And we're going to the point of what, what the, the, the pregnant mother is eating as well. So, uh, it's really important that the, that the, the child is vitamin D, um, sufficient during, um, during uh, it, the time in utero, because if, if it's not, then, then we're seeing the under, underdeveloped jaws coming out. We're seeing the immune systems that don't work. And then you're having the child that has the, the, the chronically clogged, clogged nasal sinus that begins mouth breathing at three months. And then, you know, this is a problem we're trying to fix three, um, you know, three to five years down the track or longer if they're not diagnosed. But then as the child starts to eat solids, what's the first thing that parents are giving them now? They're giving them fruit, um, purees and things like that that is absolutely devoid in vitamin d and challenge fructose challenges the liver for vitamin d and we know that it um you know kicks up blood sugars uh it, it's it's the absolute um you know recipe for poor met metabolic health which which stops um you know reduces the the vitamin d sufficiency in the body as well so the, the foods really play a role you know, we try to communicate that as a baseline that you have to get your food right you have to eat animal fats you have to reduce your you know refined sugars carbohydrates um you know, and understand that um you know whole fats are, are nourishing that we need to eat them including you know, your liver bone broth and so forth if children are eating these foods they're much more resilient their hormones are balanced and they grow quicker. So remembering that the the mid palatine suture it run it needs testosterone to grow and growth hormones. So and that is all directed by vitamin D. So a, a vitamin D deficient kid will grow slower than a, um, a a vitamin D insufficient child. So parents really kind of need to know that six months be, you know before they conceive, so they can have that those um, you know the, those things in preparation. Coming to a close, <clears throat> your book is a wonderful read. It's a very easy and digestible read, so well done. And how can people get a copy of your book? Yes, yeah, so I can just jump on Amazon, and um, yeah, or and you can find the links on my website. Uh, yeah, and so yeah, just basically a, the, the story of pricing in a modern lens, and there's a food plan in there, but also the idea, some of the mechanisms of of crooked teeth. I tried to because that lack of etiology for, for crude teeth, trying to, to bring it to food and understand that, hey, our jaws depend on what we eat. And so how we can equate that to what we're actually eating today, which is hard, but you know, like there's ways to do it. So there's a full food, food plan for people to follow as well. It's not easy, but what's the alternative? And I think we should be as, you know, as educated individuals is that we should be offered different options. And to date we haven't been. And um, so, yeah, so we, we would love to see this change. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's just that awareness, you know, that, you know, everyone does what they feel is right for them, but you know, if, if they're given the right information, at least you can say that you, you know, you weren't misinformed or, you know, you, you, you at least had the opportunity to, to do the best for yourself and your, and your family. Yeah. It's a pleasure.
Dr. Lin, thanks very much for the conversation. It's great to see you, Patrick. Thank you very much for having me.